Okay, so it gives me a uh, great pleasure to introduce Professor Alejandro Rodriguez. Uh, Professor Rodriguez is an Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering and the Director of the Program in Material Science and Engineering at Princeton University. He received bachelor's and PhD degrees in physics at MIT in 2006 and 2010 respectively, and was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. His research centers around nanophotonics, the study of light and nanostructure media, where he has made contributions to the understanding of quantum and thermal fluctuations, nonlinear optics, numerical methods, and asymptotics. Alejandro was awarded the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the National Science Foundation Early Career Award, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers Young Investigator Award, and the Department of Energy Frederick A. Howes Award in Computational Science. When he's not playing with photons, he can be found in a superposition of dancing salsa, watching films, playing the piano, listening to Cuban music, and playing strategy games. So it's uh, our honor to have you, and so whenever you're ready, please. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to, to uh, give the talk. Um, so I'll get right down to it because I know we don't have uh, that much time and I do tend to go long. Uh, so the title of my talk is Physical Limits on, on Light Scattering, a Complement to Structural Inverse Design. And, and of course, I'll, I'll be giving you more details about what all of these words mean. Um, so like Judith mentioned, you know, my area of expertise is in nanophotonics, which deals with, with you know, how to manipulate photons, either guiding or trapping light at the nanoscales or, or using nanostructured materials. And here's just a sample of the kinds of devices that we like to play with. Um, my group is a theoretical group. Um, and one of the um, questions we've been uh, addressing lately has to do with um, efficient design, effective ways of, of designing uh, optical devices. And um, along that line, you know, the traditional means of enhancing uh, things like light matter interactions or, or manipulating light in general is to uh, use uh, a combination of three main um, effects. So one, uh, Bragg scattering or band gap uh, confinement, uh, two index guiding and three some kind of some form of material um, confinement mechanism like to exploit uh, plasmons and so forth um, and as you can see in this um, sort of uh, uh, schematic figure there's been a push to miniaturize um, large-scale optical uh, systems you know cavities for instance using um, either one or a combination of these mechanisms um, and there's a, an, a broad um, designed library now of devices uh, for confining light, um, with the main uh, characteristics being that one, they, they confine uh, electromagnetic fields in very small um, volumes, therefore enhancing intensities and um, enhancing light matter interactions. And um, usually they're designed, like I said, using a, 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 for a, a set of very um, well-known uh, uh, rules for design. So in the last uh, several decades or so, a, a new kind of design uh, framework has emerged known as uh, optimi large-scale optimization, uh, optimization or inverse design. And the idea behind um, inverse design is you, you effectively have a, a uh, computer-aided approach to uh, designing arbitrarily complex structures by taking a computational domain um, applying or, or uh, discretizing in, in some way to give uh, degrees of freedom, structural degrees of freedom, and then have a, having a computer uh, formulate some or uh, maximize or minimize some optical response function of these structural parameters. Um, and the, the uh, neat thing about these algorithms is that you can search through billions of, of structures, hundreds of uh, thousands to billions of, of different um, optimization parameters to converge on, on sort of fairly complicated devices that have uh, better functionality um, in some cases. Um, in some cases, even new kinds of functionalities. And you can see a timeline here of um, related works. You can see some of these structures look fairly um, counterintuitive, especially if you look at the bottom right here. Um, and uh, again, the key is to try to find um, new mechanisms of, of uh, manipulating photons or, or uh, creating devices that have multifunctional characteristics. Um, I'll give you sorry to interrupt. If it's possible to move your microphone a little bit further from your mouth. Oh, sure, sure. Is that better? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and I just, just to um, put this uh, more concretely, um, the uh, most popular, I would say, uh, form of this kind of approach is known as topology optimization. So, it, and the idea behind topolo topology optimization is you want to maximize, again, some objective function 
uh, for instance, confined light or, or, or uh, guide light from one uh, uh, point to another. Um, and this function, of course, will depend on the uh, Maxwell's equation, so the permittivity or the structures in the, in the system, uh, and then the electric fields uh, that are uh, that are. Uh, Alejandro, now your microphone. These systems. Too, Alejandro, now your microphone is too far from your mouth. I have a hard. Okay. It shouldn't be too close, and it shouldn't be too far. So Sorry. we have to optimize the location of the vacuum. Exactly. <laughs> Can you hear now? Is that better? Yes. Better? Speak a little louder. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So um, the yeah, let me know if if uh, if uh, you need me to change. But the uh, again, the idea is to maximize some objective function of the electric field, the Maxwell's equations, and the permittivity, subject to to some constraints. Okay, and you can you can have many constraints: equality constraints, inequality constraints, um, and sort of the the typical way of um, in a topology optimization framework of uh, formulating the optimization is to uh, effectively use what's called a material relaxation to have some kind of finite grid some or uh, structural uh, discretization and then to assign to each one of these degrees of freedom a, um, a function like the permittivity um, from zero some background medium to some uh, to one some some dielectric or some material um, some uh, desired material and so the permittivity is allowed to vary in that range um, and so every pixel is a, is a continuous degree of freedom. And you, you find or you try to optimize this objective function by following the gradients using newton raphson methods, conjugate gradients. There are many sort of gradient descent algorithms that, that can be applied. And the key is effectively in computing these gradients, right? The derivatives of this function with respect to the, the various degrees of freedom, so which in this case would be the permittivity um, variations in the permittivity at every point on the discretization domain um, at each at each um, level of the iteration, at, at each level of the algorithm. And there are many ways of, of computing these things now efficiently, gradient descent methods and so forth. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about sort of the mathematics of, of how you make that, um, how you make this problem effect, you know, efficient uh, and, and the convergence and so forth because there are already a significant number of um, uh, works that, that describe these things. And, and um, it's more generally the topic of, of non-convex optimization. So instead, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you uh, to start with some selected applications, some of the recent work um, that uses this, this kind of approach to design optical systems, starting with um, mode converters. And, and you can see on the left, uh, here, it's a, a device, different stages of this optimization uh, approach, uh, different stages of, of the uh, evolution of the optimization from a uh, completely unstructured system down to a system that, that where the uh, profile of the, uh, material, of the um, device is binary. So it, 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 uh, it uh, is fabricable in that basically you have a single material and then a uh, nanostructuring uh, on top of that. Um, and the, the idea behind this device, which is basically just a slab on top of a, of a substrate, is a device that, that takes um, far field radiation incident on the device and then channels it or converts it into a propagating mode. Um, and so it, this is just a cross section of the discovered design. Um, but there are other kinds of, of uh, mode converter um, applications uh, that people have applied these these techniques to uh, far field uh, to far field converters, you know, be, to do beam steering, um, to take incident an incident plane wave and pass it through a, a structured material and then focus light, so uh, effectively a meta lens. Um, and then some of our work, for instance, um, which has dealt with how to convert light, you, you know, do mode conversion or, or spatial multiplexing on the chip. Um, uh, some of the, the results of that are illustrated here. So this is a structure, for instance, a double ring resonator structure where light at two different wavelengths at, at 1500 nanometers and at 750 nanometers is propagating, is resonant in there. Um, and here you can see this funky looking uh, structure is basically a coupler um, that was uh, arrived at using topology optimization that may, ensures that the light that's coming in um, gets perfectly uh, coupled to their ring resonator at both wavelengths simultaneously, and 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 you can extend this to to for instance to have um, you know dozens or, or even hundreds of wavelengths with uh, near perfect uh, coupling efficiency. 
Um, here's another example. So one, one of the real uh, uh, applications of, of having these kinds of mode couplers is um, a multi-frequency uh, resonators is for second harmonic generation. And the idea here is, uh, of course, very um, uh, well-known idea is if you want to enhance the um, conversion efficiency of a nonlinear process, so the, here, here's basically a Pockels effect um, where you have light incident on a, on a device and then the chi two nonlinearity, the intrinsic material nonlinearity of the device um, gives rise to uh, output light at double the frequency, so the, uh, an octave above. Um, then the, you, what you want to be able to enhance these interactions is you want to create a device that's doubly resonant, both at the incident wavelength and at the output wavelength. You want, that means um, a, a uh, doubly resonant cavity with a high quality factors, right? High, long lifetimes. And you want these two photons, right? At the, at the, at the uh, two frequencies to interact strongly. And that's captured by this uh, figure of merit that I'm showing here. Well, this, basically the second harmonic generation efficiency, the rate at which photons get upconverted depends on the product of the quality factors. And this um, expression here is nonlinear overlap, which in the context of, of waveguide propagation is known as quasi-phase matching. But in the context of a, a nano cavity or micro cavity um, is, is basically a nonlinear overlap, a spatial overlap between the fields at the fundamental, at the omega one and at the harmonic. Um, and what you want to try to do is enhance this, this nonlinear overlap while creating um, a doubly resonant uh, excitation. And here's an example of a structure, a funky looking again structure that achieves just that. It's a, it's a very small structure, so it's a wavelength scale um, cavity, um, which is not a, a photonic crystal cavity because of, of course it's really difficult to, to, to get a photonic crystal cavity that has resonances that are an octave apart. Um, so it's not a photonic crystal cavity. It's not an index guided uh, structure or an index guided cavity, but it's kind of a hybrid of the two. And um, it localizes two modes. So one at 1500, one at 750. And the cavity is designed also to get perfect coupling uh, of light at both wavelengths coming from a waveguide above. And it's, um, and again, the, the idea here is you want to, to uh, make as compact a um, second harmonic generation converter um, with uh, as large as possible uh, nonlinear uh, overlap. And if you compare the performance of these, these kinds of structures, so here's a, a scatter plot of the relevant figures of Merrick, the lifetimes of the, of the resonant modes, which again, the greater the lifetime, the, the, the longer the, the, the uh, time the light has to interact with the nonlinearity, the stronger the nonlinearity. And then the larger the nonlinear level, also the, the stronger the, the um, interaction, you can see that these devices, um, compared to some of the traditional structures out there, these the, the, you know, very big, uh, bulky uh, ring resonators, um, the structures perform better. You know, they have much stronger uh, nonlinear couplings owing to the fact that they're, they're smaller mode volume. And they have reasonable quality factors, you know, quality factors on the order of, of thousands to tens of tens of thousands. Um, so there, it's clearly it's clear that there's sort of we are discovering new kinds of devices that um, that per, that perform in, in regimes where traditional structures can't can't really perform. For instance, and, and if you take a ring resonator, for those uh, graduate students here, if you take a ring resonator, and you, you begin to decrease the diameter of the ring resonator, you can show that the radiation, the quality factors, you know, very, very uh, dramatically decreases as a function of the radius. And, and at some point uh, you can't localize uh, anymore. So index guiding fails. Um, and so there's a limit to the size of the, of the ring resonators you can use to confine light um, at two very distinct frequencies. And, and the, the um, this is, as far as I know, the state of the art is roughly a diameter of 10 micrometers, whereas these structures I'm showing here have um, effectively a diameter of a, a one micron or so, sometimes less. Um, here's another application. Um, so uh, speaking of enhancing light matter interactions, another sort of important figure of merit there is the, um, is the local density of states. So one might want to enhance the local density of states in, uh, in the vicinity of some device. And the local density of states is just the, the work on a dipole induced by the electric field radiated by a dipole. Okay, so this is a very, very relevant 
uh, quantity uh, related to many physical observables. For instance, spontaneous emission, the spontaneous emission rate of, a, of a, uh, an emitter like a quantum, a quantum dot or an, uh, an atom near a um, structured system. Um, and the, the typical figure of merit there is the quality factor, or the, sorry, the Purcell factor, which is the ratio of the quality factor of, the, of a resonator over its mode volume. And uh, this has applications, like I said, to, to, to spontaneous emission enhancement, quantum emission control, um, antenna emission, um, and so forth. Um, and here's a structure that was discovered using uh, topology optimization again, that has quality factors on the order of a thousand or so, but mode volumes that are uh, many orders of magnitude smaller than the wavelength of light. Uh, so very, very sub wavelength um, confinement. And here's just, I'm showing you the top, top down view of a, of a device. And, and it gives rise to a Purcell factor on the order of um, a million or so, which is it's, it's very high. Um, and what's neat about these, these kinds of devices is that, um, for example, if you take a ring resonator, if you make it big enough, the quality factor can be, you know, um, many, many times, many orders of magnitude bigger than this, millions or billions. Um, you sacrifice mode volume in, in doing so. And so here's a device that, that is uh, very, very compact um, and can operate with similar Purcell factors as the ones you get with uh, ring resonators, but over much bigger bandwidth. So the quality factor is much smaller, which means the operational um, bandwidth is, is much bigger. Um, so it really allows you to, to sort of um, trade off some of the, the modal confinement for spatial confinement um, in order to uh, achieve similar functionality as, as um, more traditional structure. Um, I just wanted to highlight, you know, a, 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 a related application to, to Purcell enhancement. Here's some work with uh, uh, one of our experimental colleagues at the University of Washington, Kai Mei Fu. And here's a structure. Um, this is the fabricated device that was designed to take a, an emitter, an NV center, so a quantum emitter, implanted on, the sub, on a diamond substrate. And the device is effectively um, doing two things. So it is enhancing the, the, you know, the emission rate of the emitter by, by um, creating a, a, an enhanced Purcell factor. And it's also funneling light. So increasing the collection efficiency of the, of the uh, radiation uh, upwards. So it's funneling the light upwards. Um, and the expected um, enhancement factor from the, from the theoretical uh, optimizations is 17. And, and in, in experiment, he actually sees a factor of 14 or so uh, uh, enhancement. So it's, it's, um, uh, it's just a, an example of an application where um, uh, it's really neat to see the, the um, theory and experiment be, uh, the agreement be so, uh, so close. But it brings up a question, and this is really the, the main uh, focus of the talk, which is how do we know that these kinds of op optimized uh, structures are optimal? Okay, what is the sort of the a metric for understanding the, the best possible performance that you can get from any given device? So um, to, to uh, narrow on this question, so typically we know material. So the material is something that, that, uh, that you are, um, that you know a priori that you want to work with, but you don't know which structures are going to work best for that material and for the a particular application. So when we talk about limits, right, which is in the title of the talk, really we want to understand um, what are the, the guiding design principles, right, for any given application in a way that is geometry, geometrically agnostic, but material dependent. Um, and such a, a performance bound can serve as, as a target for development. So at, think of it as a top bottom perspective. So it, it guides what you can and cannot do in any given context. And combined with, with inverse designs, which is, or structural optimization, which is a bottom up engineering approach, uh, it gives you basically a full picture of what's, what kinds of device physics you can expect um, generally in optics. So um, limits can, can, can really guide design, um, also applications. And they can also teach you new physics. So it's another reason to, to uh, think about this. Um, 
in, in, in that typically when you when you come up with a limit or with a bound, you are um, you need to specify some assumptions. And see so if you understand what those assumptions are, you can understand how to violate them if it's possible to violate them. Um, and in so doing, discover new ways of of, uh, of doing uh, optics or, or um, manipulating light. Um, and specifically, uh, you know, part of the idea behind using limits as, as guiding um, principles is to that, to tell you something about uh, the potential influence of this of the material or the size of the device uh, on the performance. And again, I'll give you more concrete um, uh, concrete examples soon. So um, again, just to put it in a, a schematic form, the, when you do inverse design, you try to maximize some objective by performing brute force uh, parameter optimization, but you never know whether that um, you know, converged design is optimal. And the reason is that Maxwell's equations are uh, nonlinear, non-convex with respect to the permittivity. So the, the, it's a non-convex optimization problem. You can, for instance, get stuck in a local maximum. A, the idea behind a lot of our recent work on, on limits is that you can formulate a, a separate problem, which is related to the inverse design problem, that um, puts a bound on achievable performance where the, the result of the, uh, of the program is basically an uh, technically uh, or in principle achievable, but maybe not achievable uh, performance limit without having to specify the precise structure. Um, and the idea here is uh, instead of doing structural optimization, the, the sets of techniques I'm gonna talk about are called dual optimization techniques. Um, one performs an optimization over the fields. Okay, so the allowed electromagnetic fields or the desired electromagnetic fields, and you incorporate um, constraints on the physical objectives coming from Maxwell's equations. And it turns out this problem, um, which again, I'll, I'll give more details on, uh, turns out to be a convex problem. Um, so I'll uh, just uh, give you a brief uh, overview. Um, so the, the uh, area of performance bounds is also known as electromagnetic asymptotics. It's not new, so there's been a, a, a lot of work over the last um, 40 to 50 years to try and put limits on um, optical devices. And uh, really it wasn't until uh, five to, to, to eight years ago, roughly, that these uh, EM asymptotics started to take on a more sophisticated flavor. Um, so they began as very heuristic, um, sort of loose asymptotics. And, and more recently, there's been sort of a program uh, with, you know, myself and a few others, uh, you know, at, at Stanford and, and at Yale that have attempted to sort of formalize, create a, a sort of computational framework that would allow you to put uh, tight limits on, on a whole host of uh, electromagnetic objectives. Um, and I'll give you a, a flavor of what, of what I mean by heuristic versus rigorous. So, and I'll do that. Let's start with, with a canonical problem. So maximizing the scattering cross-section. Um, so you have a device um, and let's say that we bound the size of the device with, with some region. So the device is confined to some domain. And I want to figure out what is the largest scattering cross-section that I can get. Um, and of course, if I change the structure inside, if I nanostructure my, my system, I, I'll, I'll change the scattering cross-section. And we, we want to do is figure out what is the, that, that maximum cross -section, achievable cross-section. So um, of course, there, there are things that are known already about uh, the, the physics of scattering cross-section. So for instance, in the ray optics, so where the, the size of the materials is much bigger than the wavelength of light, we know that the scattering cross-section, which is basically the, the maximum power that is scattered okay, um, from an object uh, due to a, you know, an incident wave, that scales like the area of, uh, of the uh, device, the area of the object. Um, so this is basically the, the regime of geometrical optics. Um, we also know that in the quasi-static regime, so the, the opposite regime, when the size of the structures are much smaller than the wavelength of light, it's possible to get scattering cross sections that are many times greater, many orders of magnitude larger than the geometric cross section. Um, 
for example, you know, an antenna, a, a metal, metallic nanoparticle will exhibit um, absorption and scattering cross sections many times larger than the the area. It's in the limit of very small particles, it's known to scale like the volume. It's called Rayleigh scattering. But the real question we are trying to get at is is how much. So what is really the limit on these on these uh, scattering cross sections? And more importantly, like I said. Um, we want to do it in a way that's independent of the size of the, of the device, so not tied to any particular approximation of the description of the problem. And that incorporates you know, every possible wave effect and the choice of material as, a, um, as, an, as an important part of the, of the problem. Okay, so to give you a flavor of the kind of um, asymptotic or limit that, that uh, that uh, is now uh, you know, almost a decade old are, are known as uh, modal decompositions, okay, or channel-based asymptotics. Um, and the idea there, um, which you know, it, it employs a set of, of techniques known as couple mode theories or you know, time-dependent time perturbation theory, is you if you have a scattering event like this, you have an incident wave and it's scattering from some object, one way to put to limit, to put a bound on the, the uh, say the, in this case, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the absorption cross section, is to decompose the, the um, scattered fields into different channels. So you can take, for example, a spherical harmonic expansion of, a, um, of a, an object, and then to um, describe the underlying physics of the scattering event for each one of those channels in terms of parameters like the, the rate at which the light couples to the device or radiates and the absorption uh, uh, rate in the structure for that channel. So these are these are sort of modal, what are called modal um, approximations or modal uh, asymptotics. And one of the things you can show, and that was shown in, in uh, you know, uh, 2007 or so and, and, and uh, applied to many of their contexts, is that the, the absorption cross section per such channel, okay, so for each spherical harmonic L scales like uh, lambda square, so okay, there's the, the, uh, the typical lambda squared scaling for scattering. And it, it scales basically, it depends on the, the radiation and the absorption rates um, associated with the, uh, the uh, coupling of, of, of mode um, at that wavelength for that channel. But the real question there is, um, it doesn't really, these kinds of asymptotics don't really address the question we are interested in, in that, um, we don't know what, how these radiative and absorption rates, um, the, the, you know, the, we don't have limits on what these, these rates can be that are independent of the geometry. So if you give me a structure like a, a nanoparticle or a, a, a cylindrical object, you can work out what these, these radiated and, and absorption rates are, but we don't have a geometry independent way of assessing how big the, the scattering cross sections can be. Nor, we know, nor do we know how many of these channels, how many of these harmonics are relevant to the scattering. Um, so this is effectively what we'd like to put limits on. Um, and uh, you know, extensions of these kinds of channel asymptotics have been um, developed over the years um, and applied to different contexts like uh, periodic gratings and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Special uh, asymptotic expansions have been done also for the, for the case of in quasi-static regimes for very, very uh, highly sub-wavelength particles. But again, um, as I mentioned, our goal is to find a limit on the scattering cross-section that's applicable to arbitrary nanophotonic settings. And the, the um, uh, work that I'm gonna talk about right now, the, the sort of, if you're interested, you can, you can follow these uh, references. It's widely applicable, not only to, to scattering cross-sections, um, even though I'm going to focus on, on the problem of, uh, of uh, scattering, but uh, really related problems in, in photonics like light trapping, cloaking, uh, Raman scattering uh, to, to optical forces, and I'll briefly talk about this, um, and even to optical communication. Um, and what's, what's uh, neat about these kinds of techniques is that they're applicable to not only optics, but any kind of wave scattering effect. So, all right, let's, let me start with some um, preliminaries. Um, we know every wave theory has, has constraints implied by mathematical relations, right? By Maxwell's equations. And so I'm just gonna just you know, give you the language we've been using, um, uh, which is, we were just talking about Maxwell's equations. 
to um, frame the asymptotics. So, and in particular, the most important quantity uh, is the uh, what's called the T operator. Okay, so and, and bear with me for a second to give you an idea what what it is. Um, so if I have a, an object and I have an incident field, okay, so I have an incident field propagating in vacuum. So G here is the, the uh, Green's function in vacuum. The T operator, okay, uh, or and let's say that that the uh, object is defined by some potential of the susceptibility, okay, V. Um, the T operator describes the relationship between the incident field and the generated currents or the, the bound polarization currents in the system. Okay, it's closely related to the, the uh, Green's function or this, what's called the scattering Green's function um, in a system. Um, and it's related to the potential and to the, green, the vacuum Green's function uh, through this relation. Okay, so this is the central relation of, of almost any scattering uh, theory. Um, you know, in quantum mechanics, this is, this is uh, related to what's known as the lippmann schwinger equation. Um, but this operator, by virtue of, of basically depending on the, the susceptibility, so the precise details of the structure or the potential, and the Green's function encodes pretty much uh, everything there is to know about the scattering. It encodes the geometry of the object, and it encodes the material property. So it allows you to solve for, for uh, uh, the net fields, okay, the scattered fields in the system. Um, and again, this, if, you're, if you're somebody who's, who's uh, used to working with, with scattering quantities, this is, this is something that you will have encountered at some point. So this T operator is related, of course, to, to uh, any kind of electromagnetic quantity you, you may be interested in. And in particular, the, if, you, if you look at the uh, power, okay, the, the absorbed power due to some incident wave on a structure, um, the scattered power or the extinction power, which is the, the sum of the two, these, quanti these, these uh, power relations can be cast as sesquilinear uh, functions of, this, of the T operator. So given the incident field and given the T operator, you know what these power quantities are. Uh, and uh, here, by the way, ASIM refers to the, this anti-skew-symmetric anti part of the uh, operator T. Um, and so everything really having to do with, with power transfer in, in a scattering event is, is given by these uh, expressions. Um, and uh, you can obtain all kinds of useful information from, from the general properties of T. So if we understand T, we understand scattering. Um, by the way, the, the typical uh, uh, optical theorem that you learn in, in, uh, in you know, introduction quantum mechanics is really just a statement of the positivity of scattering. The fact that the extinction power is basically related to the scattered and the absorbed power in this way, and that they're all positive. So it's a positivity of scattering. Um, so um, if, you take, uh, if you take the central relation of, of, of scattering, so this relationship between the T operator and, and V and G, and you consider taking uh, real and uh, imaginary parts of it, you get these two quantities. So if you multiply it on the left by, by the adjoint of T and you take real and, and imaginary parts, you get what are known as, as uh, you know, real power and reactive power conservations. So these these specific relationships between the T operator and the uh, and the potential in the Green's function are statements about where whether real or reactive power are conserved in your system, and of course they are conserved by by virtue of basically coming from uh, Maxwell's equations, and these turn out to be really important in putting constraints on on scattering, and I'll, and I'll tell you how that that comes about. Um, so the main uh, so this is, I guess, the the uh, crux of the technique is is known as Lagrange duality. Okay, and this is uh, if you're somebody who's coming from a, a, an optimization background, this is, is sort of a, a standard technique uh, used, for instance, in, in game theory, information theory, um, to put limits on on the on the algorithms. And and uh, here's the, I'm just going to give you the twenty thousand feet perspective, the 20,000 feet view, I'm not going to get into um, very technical details, but here's the idea. So in a typical inverse design problem, uh, when you're doing structural optimization, you have a Lagrangian that you're trying to maximize, right? So you, you, it, it's, the, the, it's a maximization problem of an objective function whose degrees of freedom, if you remember, are the permittivity, so the structural variations. And as I mentioned, because the, the fields 
in that optimization problem satisfy Maxwell's equations everywhere, so they satisfy this equation, then um, they depend non-linearly on the permittivity. So that's that's where non -convex the non-convexity of this problem comes in. Uh, it's in this the, the fact that this is a complicated nonlinear relationship. And as I change the permittivity, of course, then the field changes in, in very nonlinear ways. Um, uh, so even though the objective function is, is typically a quadratic function of the field, right? So for example, the intensity, the energy, the power, they're all you know, quadratic functions of the field, the uh, dependence on the optimization parameters is not. Um, and that's what gives rise to sort of the, the, the non-convexity um, and the inability to, to prove that you have an optimal solution. So the idea behind a um, dual optimization uh, approach to Lagrange duality is that um, you flip the problem. So in, in particular, you can write down the same objective function, but instead of, of um, explicitly writing the dependence of the electric uh, field and the permittivity, so in, in particular, instead of enforcing that the field satisfy Maxwell's equations, you can instead just do a free field optimization. So optimize for the, the, the field that you desire in your objective. Um, and so you choose the polarization fields as, as your degrees of freedoms, for instance, and then relax away, it's called a relaxation method, the uh, requirement that the fields come from Maxwell's equations. Uh, and in particular, the, the, um, if you, op if you um, use the, the T operator itself, um, the dielectric dependence is, is, is relaxed completely and only enters in that the polarization currents um, arise only when you have a scatterer. So the, the, the um, T operator is non-zero only when you have a scattering, when you have a material. But there is no, even though there's sort of that relationship between the presence of material and the absence of material uh, through T. So if you optimize T, um, you don't necessarily enforce that the, the uh, precise relationship between the, the polarization, the bound polarization current and the permittivity. So that's relaxed away. Now, of course, if you just do that um, by itself, you may get an optimal solution, an optimal field that has nothing to do with Maxwell's equations. So the question is, how do you reintroduce constraints uh, associated with Maxwell's equations? And you do that through Lagrange multiplier. So the idea is that you, you can implement or introduce, reintroduce aspects of the wave problem through the constraints. So and, and in particular, you can capture coarse aspects of, of the wave physics as you desire, like power conservation and so forth. Um, as, as uh, Lagrange multipliers as constraints. Um, and uh, in particular, you know, if you, if you implement or you, uh, you um, require that something like real and, and reactive power be conserved, not everywhere in the, in the structure, but on average, it turns out, so if you integrate effectively the, the uh, power uh, and you look at the net power tr uh, transfer between the incident field and the, the uh, structure, it turns out that's already sufficient to give you something interesting. And that's effectively what we did a, you know, a year or two ago. And I'm gonna just show you, uh, you can see here uh, some of our uh, early work on this. So uh, what I'm plotting here, so both on the left and on the right, is the uh, limit on the scattering cross section. So the um, scattering cross section, the largest power scattered from, the, from any structure, divided by the geometric cross section. So the geometric cross section is just basically the, the uh, area scaling of the, of the device. And again, because these are limits, the only thing we need to specify is the, uh, the radius of a spherical boundary, okay, circumscribing the device. Um, by virtue of applying this, this dual Lagrange uh, formulation, we don't say anything about what these, these uh, structures look like. Um, they're, they're really asymptotics that are independent of the, of the uh, specifics of the structures. But of course, any structure cannot have a scattering cross-section that is bigger than whatever is predicted here. And um, what I'm plotting here is the, the scattering cross-section as a function of the spherical uh, domain uh, divided by the wavelength uh, for different values of, of the susceptibility. So for uh, a metal where a real part of chi is, is minus 10, and for a dielectric, well, real part of chi is 16. So this is, you know, this say germanium and in, uh, infrared. Um, and the different curves you see here, if you focused on the solid lines, um, these different curves 
correspond to different values of, of loss, okay, material loss, this, uh, susceptibility. If you have a metal, of course, the imaginary part is closer to this blue line, right? So closer to unity. Uh, for a dielectric, you can have much, much smaller uh, loss rates. Um, and you can see that the general features here, well, aside from, from providing quantitative guidance, they make a lot of uh, sense. They're very intuitive. For very small, if you take a metal, right, uh, for a very small uh, radii, so much, much smaller than the wavelength, so a very sub-wavelength particle, the scattering cross-section scales, so there's an area scaling implicit in the geometric cross-section here, scales like the volume, it's linear in this plot, which means there's a volume dependence. Um, and this is well-known, um, a well-known well asymptotic associated with Rayleigh scattering. As the, the radius of the particle increases um, towards, you know, wavelength scale, the, uh, you can get much larger scattering cross-sections than the geometric cross-sections. Um, and particularly, this puts a limit precisely on how large that can be. And that depends on the loss rate, okay, in the system. The, in this case, the, the smaller the loss rate, the larger the scattering cross-sections you have. And, and that makes sense because you're able to basically, um, this although otherwise light gets absorbed in the system instead of re-radiated. Um, and in the limit where the radius of the domain of the device gets bigger, these limits are predicting that the scattering cross sections should asymptote to the geometric cross section. So 10 to the zero here, one uh, being the uh, uh, geometric cross section. So this really does capture all of the features that you'd expect um, from just a simple, uh, a, a simple understanding of what the scattering cross sections of a, sp a specific structure might look like. But it's putting again limits that are independent of those of those structures, and then plotted here too. If you focus on these dots, these are actual scattering cross sections obtained by applying structural optimization through inverse design for specific structures. So um, you can see that, of course, the the um, structures are not simple at all, right? They're not. You can't get these kinds of scattering cross sections if you just have a sphere. Um, but you know, for complicated structures, you can see that they are coming very close. So the the comparison here is, you know, uh, the green green dots with the green solid line. They're coming very close within factors of unity uh, from the bounds. Um, so the limits are proving to be quite tight. Um, for a dielectric, you see similar features, except um, you cannot get a very large scattering cross sections for sub wavelength dielectrics, and um, the reason being, of course, we know that even though you can get resonances, uh, you know, plas plas plasmons and polaritons and so forth for, uh, in, in sub-wavelength regimes for metals, you can't do it for a dielectric. And so the, the, the existence of a, of a lack or lack thereof of a resonance for dielectrics is very well uh, captured by the asymptotic. And similarly, if you look at the, the uh, dotted, uh, the dots here, okay, which are, uh, again, uh, results from inverse design, they're very, very close to the solid lines. Um, so they're showing again that the, the uh, bounds are, are uh, fairly tight. Um, and you see that the typical transition from Rayleigh scattering to the resonant response, a very sharp transition, right when the size of the device is becoming wavelength scale. Um, so this is, this is, is uh, it's gratifying to see that the, the asymptotics are really capturing um, all of the expected features that from from uh, uh, you know standard optical physics. Um, if you go back to the um, descriptions of the of the channel based asymptotics that, that I mentioned earlier, um, where again the the um, specifics of the geometry are required in that they they limit the radiated of the, the absorption rates that you can get for a single channel. So you say you have say you have incident light and there's a single scattering uh, channel. Um, or radiation field. Um, this, you know, there's a well, well known expressions for the, the uh, absorption rates and the scatter, uh, the, sorry, the absorption cross section and the scattering cross sections. So you get the typical Lorentzian, um, you know, uh, and, and near the resonance, you get the, the, a peak in the uh, absorption cross section. If you try to, uh, to uh, uh, apply the general limit uh, framework uh, from uh, before, to situations where there are only a single channel uh, or a single channel is uh, present. So for instance, if you have a very small sub-wavelength scatterer, um, so there aren't many, many modes or many resonances, 
you we see that the the form it may not be uh, entirely clear just from inspection here, but the form of the scattering cross section, um, it, you can get get an analytical expression for it, and it very much resembles. It's actually a Lorentzian. It 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 uh, exactly um, it corresponds to the the uh, the channel based asymptotic, except um, there's more information here because you are actually the you're actually putting limits on what the uh, the various parameters, the absorption and the the uh, radiation rate are, and how they depend on the both the the size of the structure R, um, the, or the general size of the of the system and the materials themselves. So the, you can think of the the uh, the cor the application of these asymptotics to these single channel uh, systems, so nanoparticle scattering, as putting limits on these. Phenomenal, otherwise phenomenological parameters, or very ge or geometry dependent parameters like the absorption and the radiation rate, or the the ability to create resonances in the system. So that's quite um, that's quite encouraging too. Um, you we have applied uh, you can apply the same formulation to look at uh, limits on um, scattering cross sections for periodic systems too. You don't have to rely only on, of course, uh, compact systems. And here again, uh, examples for the, in this case, we're showing the absorption cross section of a thin, uh, of, or uh, for an arbitrary structure that can be contained in a, in a thin layer um, as a function of the, the film thickness, T. Um, and again, there, for dielectrics, you see very sharp um, changes. Uh, the different lines are again, just different, different uh, parameters. Don't uh, just focus on the, the uh, general features which are you see very sharp um, instances of, of large, large absorption cross sections happening as the system allows to have resonant enhancement. So these are the, the emergence of resonances in the system. And um, ultimately, if you have a thick, what this says is if you have a thick enough uh, structure, then you can get unit absorptivity, so perfect absorption. Um, and uh, uh, specifically, again, if you look at the, the dotted uh, the dots here, these are the results of inverse um, designs of structural optimization. They're coming very, very close to, to the limits. Um, uh, similarly, for metals, you see, you see transitions from very low absorptivity for very sub-wavelengths, you know, very th uh, thin uh, structures, all the way to you know, perfect uh, absorptivity. Although this transition happens much earlier because, again, metals allow plasmonic enhancement to occur at, at sub-wavelength. So for sub-wavelength uh, regimes. Okay, um, so it, this brings up a question, though. So you know, there's still in many of these cases the the gap right between the uh, limit, okay, the asymptotic, and the inverse design is small, but it's been nevertheless non-zero. And so one question you could ask. Uh, and of course, the, the size of the gap will depend on the on the particular application, the objective. But you can ask, where is this gap coming from? And so one possibility, right, is that the inverse design is is getting stuck in a local uh, maximum, and so just basically none of these sort of inverse structures are truly optimal. They're not uh, just simply because the algorithm is getting stuck, or it could be that again, all of the results I've shown you so far are uh, uh, results where we are not solving Maxwell's equations. Again, we are, we are relaxing that problem, but only enforcing the conservation of power, okay, real and reactive power over the entire domain, basically the net or integrated power. Uh, just that sort of coarse um, constraint, okay, or assumption is enough to yield asymptotics that are coming extremely close to the, uh, to the uh, inverse designs. Uh, but you, but perhaps they're too coarse, and it makes sense if effectively that they are too coarse, uh, and therefore the the uh, most probable, uh, the 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 most likely possibility is that the limits are are too loose, are still too loose, and um, that the inverse designs are effectively sampling, um, or they're coming very very close to the to the optimal system. And so to to test that, you you have to do some kind of refinement of this idea. Um, and so the, the way to um, ensure that we can capture more and more uh, layers of physicality, so more realities having to do with, with uh, 
or more aspects of Maxwell's equations is to in, instead of enforcing uh, this sort of coarse or averaged power conservation is to enforce that power be conserved sort of everywhere in the, in the domain, okay, in the optimization domain. So the idea that, that we uh, recently uh, uh, formulated is that of breaking down the, in, the domain over which we want to understand the asymptotics into smaller and smaller subdomains, and then require that power be conserved on average within each one, each such cluster or each such uh, subdomain. So it's, if you're familiar with mean field theory, this is kind of a mean field cluster idea. Um, and uh, the, the hope, right, is that as you include more and more constraints on, on, on the relationship between, between the um, field and the, and the power in the domain, you get better and better more faithful representation of Maxwell's equations. And actually one of the things um, that you can show, so here I'm just showing the, the, um, at least schematically showing the idea is in a primal problem, you might, as you increase the, num the structural no uh, degrees of freedom, so the, the number, the discretization, you get, you might get better and better objectives, right? Because you have more, more freedom to, to um, uh, design, right? And to, and to manipulate the, the fields. As you increase, increase more and more constraints, so the, or the, what we call the hierarchy order, um, and you enforce more granularity of, of uh, as, uh, the, the uh, requirement that Maxwell's equations be satisfied at smaller and smaller scales, then this dual should uh, go down. So the limit should become tighter and this performance gap should decrease. And one of the things we can show mathematically is that in, in if a condition known as strong duality holds, which seems to hold uh, in, in pretty much all the cases we've considered, this gap can close. And you can ensure that the limits are uh, fully tight, meaning that the uh, performance, uh, the, the um, performance bounds are achievable by real structures. Um, and just to give you sort of a, 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 an example of this, uh, so here's so we, we if you looked at the at the scattering cross section again limits on the scattering cross section as a function of r, um, the uh, light lines are obtained by enforcing conservation of power in, in the net. So when you have a, just a single cluster, so the entire domain, and the solid lines, so the darker lines, are obtained by breaking up the spherical domain from before into spherical regions, so uh, four spherical regions actually. Um, and enforcing the power be conserved in each one of those regions. Uh, so just breaking up the domain into into four subdomains already gives you, gives a uh, a change to the bounds, so it tightens up the limits and brings them closer to the inverse design. This is just for four uh, clusters in this case. Um, anyway, so uh, and and sort of since then we sort of um, uh, made sure to. Uh, include a larger and larger number of uh, clusters. And it does seem effectively like the inverse designs are actually quite close to the, to the limit, which is, is a curious thing um, to note that basically structural optimization tends to produce structures that are um, quite close to the optimal. Um, so we've also uh, applied the, the framework to other problems. So I'll just give you a, an example. Of a few, specifically, we in my group we're very interested in, in fluctuation effects like thermal radiation, um, and uh, you know there's tons of, of interesting fluctuation effects in, in electromagnetism, uh, spontaneous emission, like I mentioned before, heat transfer where you know you heat an object and you you want to uh, observe how much of that radiation is absorbed by a nearby object. Um, Van der Waals interactions or Casimir uh, forces, uh, fluorescence, uh, laser physics, all of these uh, line width problems, all of these are, are can all be sort of classified as uh, under the, the umbrella of fluctuation effects. And the, the reason why they're fundamentally tied to the, the problems, I, the scattering problem I talked to, uh, about earlier is that, well, you know, the origin of these, of these uh, fluctuations they're usually, you know, quantum and thermal uh, effects or so statistical effects, but they they really are effectively just classical sources. Um, so small fluctuations inside material, you know, due to the vibrations of of materials, which either carry energy or momentum. 
Um, and so when they carry energy into the far field, we know that as, as thermal emission, uh, if they carry energy in the vicinity of another object, we call that a radiative heat transfer. If they carry momentum um, and between objects, we, you know, these are known as uh, Casimir or van der Waals forces. And then there, of course, you know, here's a few examples of, of applications of, of where Casimir physics comes in. You know, the adhesion, typical example is the adhesion of geckos in the walls is a result of a Casimir interaction, a fluctuation interaction. Um, and so, you know, these, even though these things are, are fundamentally thermodynamic quantities, it turns out uh, they're related to classical scattering problems in that the, there is a relationship between the stochastic or fluctuating currents that are created um, in the system and the, um, the material properties of the, of, the, of the system. So the susceptibility or the conductivity and the origin of the fluctuations, which in the case of thermal fluctuations are, are for example, the Planck spectrum, the Planck distribution. And this is what's known as a fluctuation dissipation theorem. So this relates the underlying sources of the fluctuations the, it could be thermal if it's a, a fluorescent effect. Also, um, there will be a corresponding fluorescent spectrum associated with it, and the um, classical electromagnetic quantities that give rise to the radiation, like the current density. The, the, uh, the uh, this is the, the typical, um, you know, Nyquist uh, relationship, uh, for instance, in for, in circuits. And so, as soon as you have sort of you understand what these fluctuating uh, sources are, then this is the problem of computing or understanding these these effects is a, is effect, effectively just a scattering problem. I, I give you a source somewhere and you compute the, the resulting field. Um, except here, the things are complicated because instead of a single source, right, a single current um, or a single uh, incident field, you have many such uh, sources throughout a, a material, throughout a system. So the problems are a bit more uh, complicated in that there are many, many more uh, interactions to consider. Um, and so the, you know, one, one example of, a, of an asymptotic, right, or a limit that most of you are, are uh, probably familiar with are, are, are what, what are called black body uh, limits, right, the black body limit. So if you ask how hot can an object get or what is the limit to thermal radiation of, a, of an object, um, most, uh, uh, you know, uh, folks studying physics know this the the uh, black body limit or the what's called the, the uh, Stefan Boltzmann law which says that the maximum amount of emission um, coming from an object is is give is basically related to the area right the area of the object the the Stefan Boltzmann constant and then the temperature and so this this asymptotic was derived you know in the 1880s or so um, and you know, in the limit of ray optics, which is why there you see the areas, the same area scaling that you see in the, in the, um, you know, when you consider scattering cross sections, uh, and so there, there is sort of an understanding of how how much thermal radiation uh, a very large object can can have, and that's the black body uh, formula, but we don't know um, how to translate such, or until recently we didn't know how to translate that limit to. Uh, nanoscale, you know, wavelength scale systems, um, and even sub-wavelength systems. Um, actually, I found this is a, a cool formula, a cool uh, picture I found online from um, Surrey Nanosystems. It's an actual picture of a, a black object. So people can nowadays design materials that can approach this limit. Um, and here's an example of a sphere that, that's, that's effectively bl black, you know, perfect black body, perfectly absorbing. Uh, or perfectly emitting, you know, they're related. Um, and so it looks like a 2D image because you can't see any, uh, any reflections, uh, uh, specular reflection from it, it's, it's kind of cool. And so people effectively figured out ways to, to make such black bodies by nanostructuring uh, materials. Um, and it's very much related to, to thermophotovoltaics, to, to uh, ongoing research on LEDs and so forth. Um, but, you know, like I said, uh, limits on, on uh, Thermal emission were primarily relegated to to very very large systems, and so recently we've applied these um, asymptotic techniques to uh, put limits on on these fluctuations effects, independent of the, the sizes and so forth. And uh, I'm not going to again go into too much detail. Suffice it to say that actually surprising surprisingly, um, some of these limits take on fairly uh, simple analytical or semi-analytical form. Um, and it's quite surprising because the, 
the uh, problems are much more complicated than, for instance, some of the scattering uh, problems I mentioned earlier, because again, you have many sources. Um, and what you can show is that a nanoscale thermal transport, so if you think about radiation, thermal radiation from small sub-wavelength objects or heat transfer between uh, objects that separated by, by small nano gaps where the assumptions of ray optics are, are no longer valid can greatly exceed the, the black body limit. So you can get much, much larger thermal radiation than what you'd expect um, from a sort of an area scaling, but it's, it's, it's highly limited by, by materials. So the, the choice of the material is very important. And you can see in this uh, sort of asymptotic expression, uh, which um, shows that it depends on the, the value of the susceptibility, how strongly, uh, how strong is the material response in the system on the dissipation, uh, in the case of heat transfer, on the separation between the materials, on the temperature, or the thermal wavelength. Um, and so these limits really um, express all of the main, the fundamental quantities needed to um, that, that put limits on, the, on thermal uh, transport. And the same thing is true for, for thermal radiation. Um, in the context of, of uh, forces or interactions, uh, one of the things we were able to show recently was that um, uh, there was a, a, uh, uh, some work we did uh, almost a decade ago where we showed that by nanostructuring, if you have two objects and you consider the van der Waals interaction between the two objects, there's a way to make that interaction repulsive by nanostructuring the, the substrate. So you have a, a small particle on top of a substrate, you can nanostructure the substrate to get a repulsive effect. Um, that's purely due to geometry. And one of the things we can show is, we showed is that the existing um, predictions and, of, of uh, repulsion show far weaker repulsion than what is possible. So it seems like you can get much larger repulsion than was predicted before. Um, that's kind of exciting. Um, I think I'm going to uh, just very briefly, uh, again, give you a flavor of what these asymptotics are telling us. Uh, again, uh, briefly, because they are related to the, the scattering asymptotics I, I mentioned earlier. If you look at the limit on thermal radiation from, again, any object, well, we're, we're bounding the amount of thermal emission that um, any object circum, you know, circumscribed by a sphere of radius R um, as a function of the, the radius of the, the, the sphere, you see similar features to the to what I showed earlier. The uh, by the way, the emissivity of a, of this of an object, which is related to the absorptivity, their their um, equivalent, scales like the volume for small radii, and then asymptotes to the black body limit at very large radii. So in the ray optics regime, so you see the transition from volume scaling to area scaling. Um, you see that. With respect to this figure of merit, which I'm showing here, is which we, it's a material loss limit, or think of it as a, a conductivity. Um, with respect to that material of, of a merit, the larger the conductivity, the larger, the smaller the losses, the larger the allowed uh, radiation, and you see a gradual, not only a transition from this kind of volumetric scaling. Um, much larger uh, emission and or absorptivity than is possible with a um, classical ray optical uh, system. But you see also these features, this, these um, bumps, which correspond to the gradual excitations of, of radiative channels or resonances that are allowed in the system as you make the object bigger. Um, and again, just very briefly, the, if you compare the asymptotics, so the, these red lines for metals or, or dielectrics um, for different material parameters, the uh, inverse designs seem to come very, very close to the, uh, to the asymptotics. So it's, again, uh, it's very neat to be able to show this. Um, uh, finally, I'll just give you another example uh, where we've applied the, the uh, limits. Uh, in particular, in this case, we're considering um, the following question. If I have a, a, a structure, or think of it as a meta surface, if, if the lateral direction is big enough, um, that is sort of rectangular and it's sub wavelength or so thin in the um, x direction. And I have a plane wave, right? And my uh, goal is to focus light. So think of, you know, create a lens that can focus light in a sub wavelength region that is a, a sub wavelength distance apart from the structure. Um, what we are showing here is that if you try to do that 
uh, for multiple angles. So, so you take a plane waves, and then they're, in this case, I believe they're separated by 15 degrees. As you increase the number of, uh, of plane waves that you wish to do this uh, on, um, the uh, ability to do that is severely constrained. Um, and in particular, the, the field intensity that you can expect to, to be able to generate, um, it, this is effectively a near field focusing objective, goes down very dramatically. So this, this, um, this uh, orange line shows the maximum field intensity you can get in that focal spot as a function of the number of channels or the number of incident plane waves that you want to do this for. <clears throat> and so you see that very quickly it goes down. And here are some of the, the structures that, that perform the, the task um, for the different uh, excitation channels. And you can see that very quickly for one channel, if you have just a single, a single normal plane wave, you can get fairly light, large focusing. As you try to do that for multiple channels simultaneously, it becomes harder and harder. Um, and the blue line here shows the, the asymptotics or the bound, also showing that they're coming within, again, a f in this case, a factor of two or so from the um, inverse designs. Um, and uh, anyway, just a, a small point is, uh, so with these calculations were done um, using basically a single cluster or net power conservation, but also adding additional clusters, so constraining uh, the uh, adding additional constraints on the uh, dual optimization up to 256 cluster gives you tighter limits, although not, not um, still not unable to, um, to uh, uh, take the gap to zero. Okay, so there's still a, a performance gap between the inverse design and the, the limits. And it's not, in this, in this application, it's not clear where that is coming from. But again, just within factors of, of, of uh, less than a factor of two. Um, anyway, okay, so this this is, um, I think I'm almost, I don't know if I uh, went over probably. Um, but, you know, I just want to leave you with the main takeaway here. So inverse design is, is typically formulated as a bottom-up engineering problem. And, and um, it's a, I think of it as a brute force uh, approach to, for design in that you're blindly searching for the optimal structures. Um, and again, this is coming from the non-convexity of, of, the, of the problem itself. And these techniques um, serve as a complement to, to inverse design in that they're, they're a top-down uh, approach for revealing performance characteristics. So, um, and even though you don't have knowledge of the best structure, so the, the uh, the, the dual optimization just tells you what the, the best performance bound is. Um, there are actually uh, increasingly uh, 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 suggestions that you could use that, the, the result of the opti optimal um, polarization currents or the optimal fields as a starting point for, for inverse design to be able to even speed up the convergence of, of uh, inverse algorithms. And most interestingly, what we find is that most, um, for most applications of interest, um, the results of inverse designs are actually nearly optimal within factors of unity of the optimal uh, performance dictated by Maxwell's equation. So what's physically possible. Um, and uh, I mentioned that related ideas that are applicable to other wave problems, uh, you know, any, any kind of sort of uh, PDE problem, quantum fluid mechanics or, or phonon scattering, all of these could, could exploit um, similar techniques. Um, so anyway, this, this is the end. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, I would like to thank my students who have been fantastic. And a lot of this work was, was performed by my postdoc, Sean Molesky. Thanks for the very thank nice you. talk. Um, You're welcome. Have any question? Looks like Ewan has a question. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, okay, I'm unmuted now. Yeah, I have, I have a few questions. I'll maybe just ask one first and then other people have a, have a chance. But one um, question I had was the, the in the dual problem, so you apply a constraint um, that's basically power conservation, but you could maybe think of other potential constraints um, that maybe, for example, you just satisfy one of Maxwell's equations rather than trying to satisfy all four or other things like that. Have people looked into that or is there, are there other, um, kind of ideas for what those constraints could be? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. So the, the point is the, uh, take, take something like, uh, they have, by the way. So they, they, in the, in, in the um, 
development of these asymptotic methods, as a matter of fact, uh, we began applying uh, coarser and coarser descriptions of, uh, of, of uh, constraints. So for instance, at first we weren't applying uh, reactive power conservation. We were just looking at real power conservation, which is sort of the, uh, the, the um, sort of a, a most straightforward thing you, you might want to do. Um, at, you, you know, at some points we were applying basically um, a conservation of momentum only. Um, and so for sure, any, any kind of uh, relation or conserve, conservation principle that, that can be arrived at um, by projecting or, or uh, by uh, manipulating the central relation, which is basically just Maxwell's equations, is fair game. So if you take you know, any, any uh, set of basis functions or testing functions on which to probe this relationship, that serves basically as a constraint. Um, uh, and, and in terms of, you know, what have people tried, you know, this very, this is very recent. So there have, there isn't really a lot of work beyond, um, you know, some of our work, as I mentioned, there are folks at, at Stanford, uh, uh, Steve Boyd and Jelena Vukovic have been uh, interested in this. Um, and uh, Owen Miller at the Yale, there's just a few, a handful of groups that are, that are, uh, that have sort of jumped on this. Um, but yeah, any, any kind of conservation uh, principle you could you could impose as a constraint. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, Masid? When you talk about um, maximizing the scattering cross-section, I assume that you are taking um, a plane wave as your incident beam. Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, that's why your scattering cross-section can be greater than the actual diameter of the object, right? So what happens yep. if, um, if you have, um, let's say, a focus beam, they're focusing on um, on the surface of the object. How does the, your definition of the scattering or your your approach to maximizing it change depending on the incident beam profile? Yeah. So the point is the the um, approach. So here here's basically something a little bit closer to what you're referring to. So here we are um, formulating the optimization problem as a set of incident and output field uh, problems. So you can, uh, you can actually formulate the problem in a way that's completely independent or agnostic of the incident and output fields. So you, know, you can take uh, a, um, a dipole source and then attempt to basically focus uh, energy in some region. Or in this case, we're taking a bunch of plane waves and then focusing, you know, aiming to, to focus or uh, um, and, this, and this is near field focusing, by the way. Um, so th there are ways to formulate the, that problem. Of course, the, the right figure of merit there is not the scattering cross section per se. If you have a dipole field, you might want to maximize something like the LDOS, like the Purcell factor, um, or the, just the net radiation coming from the source, you know, uh, at infinity, or the power absorbed in the in the structure. Um, it wouldn't be a scattering cross section per se, but but you'd formulate an objective. Uh, depending on what you, you want to do, right? Um, if you're, you're maximizing spontaneous emission, then you want to maximize the LDOS, radiative LDOS. Um, if, if, uh, if you want to convert, actually, we, I didn't show this, but we have, we've um, put limits on multiplexing or, or mode conversion. If you want to take a, an incident plane wave uh, or beam steering and sort of steer it in a different direction, you can, you can put bounds on that. Um, or, um, or basically, in a multiplexing example, take different wavelengths and map them to other um, spatial locations depending on the wavelength, we can do that as well. Um, but in the example you're referring to, you know, we wouldn't compute something like a scattering cross section, right? We would compute something like radiative, radiative LDOS. Okay. okay. Uh, Jessica, do you have other questions? Even you, you said you had to Yeah, I, I, I have a couple more that I can ask, but I'll ask one. So one of the questions I have with seeing some, some of your work along these lines and then other people's work too, is that a lot of the structures that inverse design produces seem very arbitrary, even for situations where there, it's maybe somewhat, um, maybe there are only a couple of things you have to worry about. So I think there was one example you had at the beginning for like the, the Chi-2 sort of structure where you had two different wavelengths coming in and the total domain was very symmetric and you just have two wavelengths, but then the structure that you end up with looks 
very arbitrary in, in this sense, right? And I don't know, I would have sort of expected that the optimal, if there is a global optimum, that that has more regularity or periodicity is maybe the wrong word, but something that looks more symmetric, more regular than this. Do you think that's true? So, or do you think even the global optimum is gonna look this arbitrary? No, that's a good point. So the reason why you're seeing an asymmetry here has more to do with the choice of the objective than something sort of intrinsic to the to the problem. Okay, so it's true that here, for example, this is an experimental collaboration. So here we are actually doing frequency conversion, a, a you know of modes having different polarizations because of the 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 um, the anisotropy of the polarization tensor uh, of the nonlinear tensor. But and that determines some of the structure as well as the the you know the way we are optimizing, we are creating these devices is by um, maximizing the local density of states at the center of the cavity and enforcing that the resulting fields have maximum overlap. And so that the, the, the choice of the, of the uh, orientation of the dipole determines basically breaks the symmetry and, and determines how the structures look. Of course, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons why structural optimization seems to work so well okay, in, in getting you so close to, to, to optimal performance is that in the phase space and the electromagnetic phase space, there's so many different, I think this is, this is typical of wave problems. Like there's so many different possible choices that have, there, there's no unique optimum. That's my point. There's so many different nearby optims, uh, 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 optimums that, um, you know, the, the, basically if I, I, can, I can change um, gradually aspects of this structure while keeping the performance uh, the same, as long as there's some overall um, mechanism, like physical mechanism that's at play. And in here, by the way, po a posteriori, you can ask, right? Like once you discover some of these structures, what is, does, is it telling you something? Is there some fundamental principle at play here? And in this case, one of the things we, we know is that it's discovering structures in order to get um, two wavelength, two far separated uh, uh, resonators in the smallest possible volume, it's making use of, of something called multiple cancellation. So it's trying to, to uh, if, if you're familiar, it's trying to basically um, cancel different radiative multiples of the, of the LDAS by picking the precise interference pattern while simultaneously ensuring that the field patterns, uh, you know, maximize this, uh, this objective. But there are many different ways of doing that. Um, another example of that um, Ian, is if you look at this structure, so this is actually um, work by uh, Sigmund. Um, if, if you look at this structure, so this is a, a, a dielectric. Uh, I, didn't, I don't know if I mentioned that, but this is a dielectric. It's like silicon on, on vacuum. And this structure is, is basically enhancing the Purcell factor. Um, and so, you know, there's a little dipole here and you're just enhancing the total emission. Um, and so this structure is funky looking, but it, there, but it's actually a, a fairly simple to understand what's going on here. It's a hybrid structure. There's a slot waveguide, effectively a slot cavity right in the center and the dipole is lying right in between. And, in be and, and then around it, there's basically a Bragg grating. It's basically a, a, a photonic crystal. So this is basically using some kind of hybrid confinement mechanism where it's, it's doing both things, um, mm -hmm. using both, both uh, uh, mechanisms simultaneously. So there are, there are a few examples of, of systems where the result is sort of intuitive. Um, and maybe, maybe you know, people hadn't thought of doing something like this before, but you know, a posteriori, you can think, you can reason about why, why it's uh, discovering these kinds of structures. Um, but it's not unique by any uh, you know, stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I think in a, in a lot of these, um kind of inverse design problems, a lot of times I've heard the answer, well, we're not necessarily searching for the global optimum, we're just searching for a structure that works well, and we yeah. found some structure. But, yeah. but your talk was interesting because you were actually kind of interested in where that global optimum was and trying to put bounds on that. Which was right, and, and I talked, by the way, about examples where the optimum um, is you know, within a factor of 10 from the inverse design, but there are actually situations where that's not the case. Um, and, and where there is significant room for improvement and where we know we are getting stuck. For example, some of these sort of uh, multifunctional metasurfaces are, are the, the inverse designs are actually getting stuck and, and we have reason to believe that you can do much better. 
My only, so I had one other question, or I guess I'll ask, the only other question was a little specific, was for the um, the situation where you had the NV center and you're trying to scatter light out of that. How did you get the, um, or your collaborator, uh, how did they get the, the NV center exactly where you want at the center of that structure? Was it a situation where you found where the NV center was on the bare material first and then fabricated this on top or? or the so th they did two things. So they tried that, but I know also we, we fabricated a bunch of devices and then we um, we imaged sort of the location of the MV center and uh, after the fact, um, and it just turns out, yeah, some devices, you know, they had in a high enough density of MV centers that, you know, you, you could you always see a lot of emission from, from many of the devices, but also um, it turns out one of the things we did in the optimization is to try to make the, the uh, collection efficiency and the enhancement as robust as possible to the lateral displacement of the uh, NV center, and that, um, and, and they could control the the, the um, depth um, much more, you know, to within 15 to 20 nanometers, I believe, than the lateral uh, location. Okay, thank you. That was all my questions. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Do we have good questions? Oh, do we have other questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes. So when you're doing optimizations, do you need to consider any uncertainties? And if you do, how do you do that? Yeah, so, okay. Um, if you mean by uncertainty, you mean like fabrication imperfections, um, you can. So, okay, some of the things that go into these, um, these kinds of structures, right? So you can put further constraints on the optimization. Um, like I said, you start you start with a with a sort of a, a, a problem, a fully relaxed problem. It's called a material relaxation, where you allow every point on the grid to take on a continuous uh, range, right? And so that's not realistic at all. So in order to get a structure that looks like this, right, that's fabricable, you need to to binarize the structure. And so you do that using something called a fi filter regularization technique, where you try to force the structure to find binary, sorry, for, for, force the algorithm to find binary structures. And then you can put constraints on the size. So you say like, I don't want a structure that has um, general size, you know, uh, smaller than some minimum feature. So there are minimum feature constraints that you can add on the optimization. And that, in, that sort of alleviates some of the fabrication uncertainties you might have. Um, you can also, uh, uh, you know, do a lot of, uh, actually Steve Boyd at Stanford has been very interested in this doing robust optimization. So you can, you can uh, make sure that the algor algorithm is uh, robust to imperfections or application imperfections. Um, and there are sort of well-known optimization techniques to do this, you know, the, the area of, of cost sensitivity analysis. Um, so the, yeah, you, you can put all of these things oftentimes as constraints on the optimization problem. Good question. Thank you. So do we have um, other questions? Let's see. Um, I, I did have a brief question. Um, just for the for the uh, the looking at the particles of different sizes. Um, if you if you give yourself a larger region, it seems like the scattering is better for smaller particles. Sometimes, how do you keep it from kind of finding a small, smaller particle solution? For just a larger range, yeah. So here's a here's a a cav or a, maybe a subtlety that that uh, maybe get, it may get lost. Remember that what I'm plotting here, okay, the bounds are scattering cross section, so power total scattered power divided by the geometric cross section. Okay, so what we're showing here is the relative, you know, the relative performance of a particle, okay, or a device of some size, some radius, divided by the performance you'd expect from a, a device of much bigger area. So you're dividing effectively by the area. It's not the total power, it's the power per unit area. Yeah, and so yeah. all this is saying is that the power per unit area of some device, right? Is uh, is bigger or smaller, right? It's it's a um, it's not saying that the overall power is bigger. As you increase the size of a device, the overall power scattered power will get bigger. So that that's uh, typically monotonic. Okay, it is um, relative. I, I I missed that. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's it's an important point, right? Like it's not saying, hey, 
there's an optimal size, right, for a scatterer or a thermal emitter that that maximizes power. No, that you probably want the biggest. Uh, that that will scale with the with the area with the total volume. But if you want to maximize power per unit area, right, emissivity, then there is indeed an, for a given material uh, choice of material, there is an optimum uh, size. Okay, or conversely, for a given size, there's an optimal material. Yeah, it's a good good point. I think it, it gets lost uh, sometimes in the uh, discussion. Uh, so do we have any other questions? Okay. If not, um, we really appreciate you uh, speaking. And we I know it's, you know, two hours ahead where, where you are, you're at. So um, okay. really enjoyed no your talk and really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope I can visit Arizona uh, at some point. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.